We'd like to thank all of you for coming by today. Um, we're just pleased to have Dr. Maki visit us again. He was here on June 1st, and those of you that were here must have been spellbound, because I was, by his speech. And he has agreed to come back here for another one of his uh, presentations. And his presentation is called America's Pro uh, Promise. But Dr. Maki is the president and CEO of the Go For Broke National Educational Center uh, in Los Angeles. And he's also the lead author author of Achieving the Impossible Dream, How Japanese Americans Obtained Redress. Dr. Maki, as I said, was in this very room several months ago for the opening of the Go For Broke National Educational Center's traveling exhibit, and, which is just outside the door, uh, entitled, and uh, New Mexico JCL is proud to partner with them by putting up, uh, thanks to Nikki Nojima, where is she, Nojima Lewis? She's way in the back and she's not listening. But she was in charge of Courage and Compassion, our shared story of the Japanese American World War II experience. So in this uh, national exhibit, we also have uh, an exhibit that is personal to New Mexico because the stories, artifacts, are from uh, some of the internees that were here in New Mexico and also the people that were in the community at the time these camps, the, there were four camps that were located here in New Mexico. Um, the exhibit will be on view until November the 3rd at this museum and again, we thank Dr. Maki's uh, Go For Broke National Educational Center for bringing it here to Albuquerque. It's already been to nine other cities, and Albuquerque is the 10th city. And from what I read in reports, you all plan to add some other cities eventually and take it around. But it's a very impressive uh, exhibit, and we're just fortunate that they brought it here to Albuquerque because we've got our own stories to share with it. So, right now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mitchell Maki. Thank you, Esther. Oh, this is loud, okay. Thank you, Esther, and thank you to the New Mexico JACL for inviting me back. Thank you to the Albuquerque Museum for hosting this event. I'm delighted to be back. So let's go ahead and get started, because I was told I have 45 minutes, and normally I talk for five hours on this. So if you all can stay for five hours, I would meet you in the parking lot, and we can continue afterwards. How many of you have been through the exhibit? Wonderful. And for those who haven't been through the exhibit, please take a few minutes to go through Courage and Compassion. It tells the World War II story of what happened with Japanese Americans, but equally important, it talks about the local story here in Albuquerque and in New Mexico and how New Mexicans responded in that time of crisis. What I'm here to talk about today is I will touch upon the World War II experience, but more importantly, I will talk about what happened after World War II as Japanese Americans and, and our nation came to grips with what happened to American citizens during World War II. So with no further ado, let's jump right into it. December 7, 1941, the Imperial Nation of Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, and it thrusts the United States into World War II. Immediately, Americans of Japanese ancestry, Japanese Americans, began to wonder what would happen to us. Would we be treated like the American citizens we were? Two-thirds of us had been born in this nation and were Americans by birthright. Or would we be treated like the enemy because we shared a common heritage? Well, we received our answer two months later when Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which created the underpinnings by which nearly 120,000 individuals of Japanese ancestry would be forcibly excluded from the West Coast, made to give up their possessions, and incarcerated in 10 camps 
across the United States. They lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they lost their neighborhoods, but most important, they lost their sense of place at the American table of citizenship. Now let me take a moment here to say, you will hear me use very specific words in this uh, presentation. I don't say internment camp, I say concentration camp. I don't say interned, I say incarcerated. I don't say internee, I say inmate. I don't say evacuation, I say forcibly excluded. Because I believe that these are the words that truly depict what happened at that time. And these were also the words that even our president at that time, Franklin Roosevelt, used. Anybody have a guess as to why I don't use the word internment or intern and use, in fact, the word uh, incarcerate or concentration camp? Any, anyone have a guess as to why that's a, a big deal? Yeah, go ahead. Because words matter and you, uh, you're being definitive of what should have been. That was, yes. It's a euphemism, yes. And what is it a euphemism for? For prisoners. Prisoners. But there's also a very technical, and you know, normally I would, uh, okay, one more, one more. In the <laughs> we're going to meet in the parking lot. Yeah. There were displaced persons camps um, in Europe, and maybe that's what they called them, that it was a place for refugees. Let me uh, touch on the Jewish experience in just a moment. Uh, there's a technical reason also why I don't use the word in, intern or internment. In times of war, when a nation interns individuals, they are enemy aliens. They are the individuals from the nation with which we were at war with. So it would be correct to say we were interning Japanese from Japan because we were at war with them. But if we were to say we were interned, we would be, in a sense, saying that we weren't American citizens. So it's a very technical use of the word. And the word concentration camp is a word that Franklin Delano Roosevelt used himself in describing the camps. Now, having said that, I want to be very clear that when I use the word concentration camp, I am in no way comparing what happened to Jews in Nazi Germany to what happened to Japanese Americans here in the United States. The annihilation of six million individuals is not something you compare to what happened to Japanese Americans. And I don't think any reasonable person does that. But in fact, what did the Jews call their camps in Nazi Germany? Death camps, yes. And I think it's important for us, and also extermination camps is another term. I think it's important for us to consider the terms that we actually uh, use and depict what actually happened at that time. One more euphemism that I'll share with you. If you ever look closely, and I think it's in the exhibit here, at the posters that were posted telling Japanese Americans where to go to be sent off to camp, it said, all individuals of Japanese ancestry, both alien and non-alien, are to report to a certain place. Well, we all know what alien means in this context. It means somebody from a different country. But what's a non-alien? A citizen, right? And the U.S. government at that time even knew that they couldn't say all U.S. citizens of Japanese ancestry are about to be deprived of their constitutional rights. So they came up with this euphemism of non-alien. You know, so for all of us in this room who are American citizens, welcome my fellow non-aliens. <laughs> so. so Japanese Americans were sent off to these camps, and certainly we could speak for hours of these camps, but they were they were in the most godforsaken areas in our nation. And I've been to many of them. They're in the middle of deserts where it gets well below freezing uh, during the winter and well above 100 during the summer. They were in swamplands. They were in the most remote areas. They were in places that most people would not choose to go and live. We lived in barracks at that time. The, the family structure deteriorated as the men would eat with the men, the women and small children would eat together, the, the teenagers would eat together, and of course all of their personal freedoms had been taken away. People lived under these conditions for three to five years of their life. But in 1943, the U.S. government comes up with an idea. The war effort was going poorly in Europe, and the decision was that we needed more men literally more men to go and fight. So the idea came up that we would create an all Japanese American segregated unit to go and fight in uh, Europe. 
also those who could speak Japanese would be trained to serve as interpreters and translators in the Pacific theater. Now, imagine the angst and the irony and, and just the difficulty of that decision for these families that were behind barbed wire. Okay, for a moment now, I'm going to make you all honorary Japanese Americans. Those of you who are already Japanese Americans, you're double Japanese Americans now, right? I'm going to make you all 20 years old. Oh, how good that would be, right? We're all 20 years old, we're all Japanese American, and here's the kicker, you're all male. So to the women in the room, I apologize, this will just take a, few, a minute or so, but you're all 20-year-old Japanese American males, you're in a camp, your family has lost everything, uh, you've lost your farm, you've lost your home, you've lost your job, you've lost your neighborhood, and you've lost your constitutional rights. And the government says now to you, I want you to go for fight, to fight for freedom and liberty halfway across the world. How many of you say, send me? There's one, okay, Andy, okay. Anybody else? Don't leave Andy out there alone now, okay? We got another person, okay, thank you. Any, can I get a third person to say, yeah, I'll go, I'll go. And how many of you would say, hell no, I'm not going to go? Okay, but then there are some of you who didn't raise your hand, so you're on the fence, right? Okay, so all, the, all of you who didn't have said hell no, that's because you're all post-60s, right? You've learned how to say hell no, I won't go. All right, who, raise your hands again if you said I'm not going. All right, why not? I find it uh, just horrible in the idea that you can incarcerate my whole family and then expect me to give my life for the, the system that would put us there. Another comment. Who else said they wouldn't go? Yes. I just wouldn't go because I'm opposed to war. I wouldn't go because I'm opposed to war. Yes. Another comment. Who else wouldn't go? Anybody else? There are so many hands, and now there's no voices. <laughs> oh, here we go. Because I'd wonder what would happen to my family if I left them. And that was a real concern for some of these Japanese-American young men because their parents were first generation, didn't speak English, many of them well, and they were in the middle of nowhere. They were fearful. They didn't know what was going to happen. And they would look at their oldest son at times, or any of their sons, and say, you can't leave us here. So there were family commitments. There were philosophical commitments about just being anti-war. And then there were political commitments of, hell no, I'm not going to go after what you've just done to me. You know, give us back our rights, and maybe I'll consider it. OK, what's the flip side? Why would you go? I'll call on you next. Okay. <laughs> um, well, as you mentioned, uh, that all of our rights and all the property that we've had, uh, uh, at least we would get a chance to get some of that back. We, we, we wouldn't know what in the future what we might have left um, if we were even to have those rights if we don't go. Profound. And I'm going to expand on what you just said. By going, we prove that we're American. By going, we, we have a chance that we will get back some of the things that were taken from us. But most importantly, that we will have a place back in America and at the table of citizenship. And in fact, there was a young sergeant, and his name was Kazuo Masuda, and he was asked at that time, why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself in harm's way while your own family has been denied their constitutional rights? And his answer was the answer that I think many of the Nisei soldiers would have given at that time was, and it was, because this is the only way that I know that my family can have a chance in America. Right or wrong, agree with him or not, the Nisei soldiers of World War II understood that in 1943, 1944, and 1945, loyalty needed to be demonstrated in blood. And this argument tore our community apart. And in fact, just at the recent Japanese American Citizens League convention, they had a, a historic vote in terms of trying to atone for the stances that the uh, JACL had taken at that particular time. But as many of you know, this segregated unit in Europe, known as the 100th Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, 
would go on to become the most highly decorated unit of their size in American military history. It's astounding to think of this. Young men from Hawaii, where they were working on the plantations, young men from the concentration camps here in the United States, continental United States, would go on and become the most highly decorated unit of their size in American military history. 9,500 Purple Hearts. And as we know, the Purple Heart is the medal that you receive when you're wounded or killed. Seven presidential citations. Other battalions, other uh, regiments, if they were to get one presidential citation, it's a, a, monu a momentous thing. The 442nd received seven presidential citations and 21 medals of honor, which is an incredible amount of honors for any regiment, let alone battalion. In Japan, or excuse me, in the Pacific Theater, young Japanese Americans would serve in the military intelligence service where they would translate uh, in intercepted messages. They would uh, interrogate prisoners of war that were captured from the Imperial Army, and they would help General MacArthur and his other generals to understand the cultural context of the enemy which they were fighting. And they were credited with helping to end the war two years earlier than otherwise would have happened. Two years earlier, how many lives did they save on both sides of the conflict? So it's an incredible story, and we tell that in the exhibition here, so please go and visit it. But just to fast forward, the war ends in 1945. The camps are closed. Japanese Americans that were in the camp are given $25 and a one-way train ticket to go and reestablish their lives. What do you think Japanese Americans were thinking about when they left camp? Were they thinking, we need to start a redress movement, we need to start a movement for reparations and an apology, or were there other thoughts that they were thinking? You're shaking your head, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I'm Japanese American, and my parents and grandparents, I never heard about the camps until I was in college. And so I think they were too, I don't know, too timid or too, I don't know what the term is, but um, they weren't that outspoken. To be so we weren't outspoken in terms of thinking about a political movement. You shook your head also. If I can come over here, you in the purple. What do you, what do you think Japanese Americans were thinking at that time? Well, I personally would th plan on what my next step was to establish a new life. Exactly. I mean, to be very pragmatic about it, you have $25 a one-way train ticket, where are we going to go? How do we put food on the table? How do we put roofs over our heads? How do we get the kids back in school? How do I get a job? How do I put my community back together? It's all the Maslow hierarchy of needs that the average Japanese American family was thinking about at that particular time. But there was another feeling that was pervasive in the community, and that was a feeling of shame a feeling that somehow we had done something to bring this terrible, egregious violation of the Constitution upon ourselves. And the best analogy that I can give you is that of an incest survivor or of a sexual assault survivor who, through no fault of their own, had something terrible happen to them, and they blamed themselves. If only I had been a better kid. If only I hadn't said this. If only I hadn't gone there. If only, if only, if only and they blame themselves. It is a classic example of identification with the oppressor. And so Japanese Americans had this sense of shame, and the feeling then was, let's be 110% American. Let's be so American that this will never happen to us again. We blamed ourselves. And that's why a lot of times Japanese Americans that are my age and a little bit older, we don't speak Japanese because our parents didn't want us speaking Japanese. They wanted us learning the king's English, going to school, getting good jobs, so that this tragedy would never happen to us again. The 50s comes along, and the 50s is a great time of change in our nation. Let me ask a, a, a trivia question here. Earlier I said two-thirds of the Japanese Americans that were sent off to these camps were citizens by birth. Why weren't the other third American citizens? They had been here, many of them, for 20, 30, 40, some even 50 years. They were American by practice, by loyalty, and by tradition. Why weren't they American citizens? 
They were not allowed to be. It was illegal. They, Japanese at that time, in 1941, 1942, were considered aliens ineligible to citizenship. They were prohibited by law from being American citizens. So that's why we say two-thirds were American citizens and the other third were not. But in 1952, that changes. The McCarran-Walters Act is passed and it allows Japanese for the first time to naturalize and become American citizens. 1954, we have Brown versus Board of Education that says separate but equal is no longer the law of the land. The Civil Rights Movement begins in the 50s, so a time of great change. But something happens in 1959 that I would argue sets the stage for us someday possibly getting an acknowledgement from the U.S. government. What happens in 1959? Hawaii becomes a state. If I had brownie points to give, you would get two right now. <laughs> in fact, I'll give them to you. <laughs> Hawaii becomes a state in 1959. Why is that important? Japanese Americans there. And you have uh, political, uh, you have senators. Right, so the answer that was given is because you have so many Asian Americans in Hawaii, so many Japanese Americans, and with statehood comes representation. We get a representative at that time uh, sent to the Congress, you have two senators sent to the U.S. Senate, and because of the large number of Asian Americans and Japanese Americans, you now have the possibility of representation. And in fact, one of the, the very first representatives sent to Congress from Hawaii was a young man named Daniel K. Inoue. And Daniel Inoue served in the 442nd. He was one of those soldiers that went over to Europe, earned a Purple Heart because he lost his right arm in battle fighting for his nation, the United States of America. What better symbol of loyalty to send to Congress than somebody like Captain at that time, Inoue, and Representative Inoue. So we now have the beginning of representation in Washington, D.C. The 60s comes along, and as those of us who are old enough, we can remember the 60s was a time of tremendous change in the United States. We have the civil rights movement going full, blow, uh, full, full board. We have the women's movement. We have the uh, anti-war movement where young Americans learn to say, hell no, I won't go, that learn that dissent can be an American value. And we had the ethnic studies program movement in many university colleges as young ethnic Americans, and in this case, young Japanese Americans, began to question their history and began to say, what happened to us, especially during World War II? But in the early 60s, we were still a long ways away as a community from saying, we want an apology, we want redress. And as an example, at UCLA in 1962, there was a professor named Roger Daniels. And uh, Professor Daniels is a history professor. His first assignment to his class was to write an autobiography. So he had two young Japanese-American sansei, uh, third generation, who wrote their autobiographies and handed it in to him. He started reading them, and both of them started off their autobiography by saying, I was born in 1943 in Los Angeles, blah, 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 blah. Dr. Daniels looked at that and he said, oh, there's a problem here. He calls them both into his office. He said, there's a problem with your autobiographies. And they both looked at him and said, we didn't cheat. I mean, how do you cheat on an autobiography, right? <laughs> yeah. So he said, that's not what I'm talking about. Go home, show this to your parents, come back and talk to me. What's wrong with that statement? I was born in Los Angeles in 1943. There were no Japanese Americans in Los Angeles. And actually, I, I, I've said this in the past, that there were no Japanese Americans. Subsequently, I have identified a few Japanese Americans that flew under the radar screen. But that's for the next lecture when you ask me to come back, right? <laughs> but yes, for the most part, there were no Japanese Americans in Los Angeles in 1943. So how could this be? Sure enough, one of the young uh, men comes back the next day, and he says to Professor Daniels, Dr. Daniels, you're right, I showed this to my family, and I was born in 1943, but not in Los Angeles. 
I was born in Manzanar. And at that time, he would have said internment. He said, I was born in Manzanar, an internment camp. The pain, the shame, the wanting to forget for many of these families was so powerful that they wouldn't even tell their own children about where they had been born or where they had been raised. So we had a lot of work to do you know, in, in the 60s. And with the ethnic studies programs going on, a lot of the young Sansei, third generation, many of them were you know, right out of high school, they were in college, they were young adults, and they started to look back at what happened during World War II, and they would ask their parents, what happened? Why did you go? Why didn't you say, hell no, I won't go? Why didn't you fight? We would have fought. And their parents would just look at them and say, you don't understand. It was a different time and a different place. And there was a generational divide that started to occur at that particular time as these young Japanese Americans, the Sansei, would look at their parents through the lens of accommodation and cowardice. And for those of you, and I'm a father, and I think nothing would hurt me more than if my children looked at me and thought I was a coward and that I couldn't stand up for myself. And it was a very painful time in our community. In the 70s, things continued to change, in particular for the Japanese American community. So we already have Representative Inoue, who is now Senator Inoue from Hawaii. 1974, Norm Mineta, who was a 10-year-old boy when he and his family were sent off to Heart Mountain Concentration Camp, is elected to the House of Representatives from San Jose. 1976, Spark Matsunaga, who had been a representative, now becomes the second senator uh, from Hawaii to be in Washington, D.C. Spark was a member of the 100th Battalion. And in 1978, Bob Matsui, who was a six-month-old baby from Sacramento, when he and his family were sent off to camp, is elected to the House of Representatives from Sacramento. So now we truly have representation in the Congress. Two senators who are former veterans of the U.S. military and two former inmates of an American concentration camp. So we now have people who can tell our story at the highest level. But we as a community were still very divided on the issue. And there were generally three trains of thought. The first was, let it go. This happened to us a long time ago. It's been 30 years. We're doing better now. Is it 30 minutes already? OK, we'll see it when I stop. <laughs> but OK, uh, okay. The, first, the first group said, let it go. It's, it's been a long time ago. We're doing so much better now. We don't want to have to remember and tell that story again. Second group says, no, we are deserving of a good, straight apology. Give us a good apology for what happened to us in, that, uh, in those years. And then there's a third group that said, you're right, we are deserving of an apology, but we also want you to show me the money. You know, there's an apology and there's mon uh, monetary payments that need to come along with this apology. Okay, so it's the 70s. I'm making you all Japanese Americans again. Who's in that first group that might say, it's been a while, let's let it go? The e okay, it, well, the Issei are going to Who amongst you are in that group that might say, let's let it go? Anybody? So we got one person, you know I'm going to call on you now, right? <laughs> but okay, we have one person who says, let it go. Anybody else want to say, let it go? How many of you are in that second group that says, just give me a good, clean apology, a good, straight up apology? All right, we got some hands going up. And how many of you are in that third group that says, show me the money? All right, we got a whole bunch of hands here. All right, so I'm going to call on you. Uh, thank you for raising your hand and being the example that everybody's welcome, but nobody's safe here. Okay. Why would you say, let it go? Well, it sounds so weak, but I think it's a personality thing where um, look toward the future, be positive, and uh, let people reconcile with the past on their own. Look to the future, be positive, reconcile the past on your own. And that truly was the feeling of a number of people. And now, some other people said the Issei felt, the first generation, the older Japanese Americans felt this way. And that's very true, because for many of them, they did not want to have to relive that time in their life. They, when I spoke to many of them, they would say, don't make me tell that story again. 
Don't make me go through that time. Don't make me feel that pain again. We're doing better. We're not public enemy number one. Let's just move on. And I remember I was a college student during that time, and I remember speaking to a woman who I thought was elderly. She was like 62. Now that, <laughs> now that doesn't sound so elderly anymore, you know? <laughs> but but I, I said to her, isn't this redress movement great? We're going to demand an apology, and we're going to demand money. And she said, no, I don't think so. And I said, what? That's crazy. What, what? And I caught myself, right? And I said, well, why? And she said, look, I'm 62. I work for the federal government. I'm going to re retire in a few years. I don't want them getting mad at me and taking away my pension. And my response was, that's crazy. And I had to stop myself. This, as crazy as that sounded to me as an 18-year-old, I had to remember that this was a woman who had lived through a time when they did much more than just take away someone's pension. They had turned her life upside down. They had taken away her family's farm. They had taken away her community. They had broken up her family. Who was I, as an 18-year-old kid, to tell this woman how to feel and what to do? And it was, a, it was a very moving moment for me to realize that, that in any movement, we have to respect the voices of our elderly. And even though I continued to disagree with her because I thought the movement was a great movement, I had to be sensitive to that and, and, and supportive of her. Okay, let's go to the second group that says, good, clean apology. Who raised their hand? Okay, go ahead. My thinking is that definitely an apology was needed, but the idea of adding money to it just didn't, doesn't appeal to me. It just seems like it's that apology that was the most important. Why doesn't the money appeal to you? Because money doesn't make it right. Uh, but the apology, if it's well done and well intentioned and tr it's truly heartfelt, then that's really what was needed. Um, I just think an apology was necessary because they made a mistake, and admitting that the mistake was made is the most important thing to me. And a lot of people felt that way. That let's just get a good, clean apology for a number of reasons. One is, if you ask for money, money dirties it. Yeah, and, and that people are just going to focus on the money and say it's only about the dollars, and, and the principle is lo lost in terms of apologizing for the wrong. There's also a very pragmatic reason which was, oh, come on guys, there's no way we're going to get an apology and money. You know, this is unprecedented at the time. Let's get what we can get, which would be possibly an apology. Let's make an educational campaign out of this. Let's make sure people know about it. But there's no way we're going to get money, so that's just going to kill it. So let's try and get what we can get. And then there was a very principled perspective, which was, and don't insult me. Don't take away my constitutional rights, throw me in jail for three or four years, and then come out and throw a few thousand dollars my way and say everything's fine now. Don't insult me, don't put a price tag on my civil liberties. Just give me that good, clean apology. Okay, now we're in that last group that says, yeah, yeah, show me the money. Who raised their hand? Well, I think the issue is I don't know how you would size the reparation. But their lives were destroyed. Their, their futures were uncertain. Their whole, they were shattered economically, I'm sure. So yes, an apology and r reparations. Yeah, I, I agree that the apology is, is paramount, but they were destroyed economically. And in this country, money talks. And if they have to pay, you get their attention. And this is one way of letting them know, if you screw up like this again, it's going to cost you money. And, and to a lot of those people, that's what is paramount to them. And so you have to have that, that uh, recompense to make sure that they, they feel some pain. 
and you, were, you, were, you hit the nail on the head when you said, in this country, money talks. And in fact, there was a, ju a Japanese-American judge at that time, William Maritani, who said that exact word, those exact words, money talks. And if you don't believe me, the next time you have a moving violation, try going into the court and say, Your Honor, I'm sorry, can I leave now? And you'll see how quickly money is attached to that apology, right? But the other argument was, there were real damages here. It wasn't like they just called us names and hurt our feelings, right? People lost their homes, their jobs, and so forth, right? So there were real damages, and we needed to have real uh, compensation for that wrong. All right, now you're all, okay, I'm going to make you all in that third group. You're all, we're all in the show me the money group. Then there was a further uh, debate. Should it be individual payments or should it be group payments? Should each of us get $25,000, or should we pool our monies together and have a billion dollars for the community? How many of you say individual? I want, I want it individually. Great. And how many of you say group payments? Okay. And as you can see, I mean, here we, I'm going to make the assumption that you're all people of goodwill. And... But even in this room, we can't agree. You know, imagine what a whole community that went through this uh, in debating this, they couldn't agree. In the interest of time, I won't call on you right now. But the argument was, on the group side, if we pool our monies together, we can do great and wonderful things. We can build monuments. We can build museums. We can write curriculum that would tell the story for future generations to hear. Right? And those of you who take the money individually, you're going to take your $25,000, go out and buy a Camry. Six years from now, it's going to break down, and then the story is going to be forgotten. So let's pool our money together and do a group payment, right? Those on the individual side, however, said, wait a second. It's individuals who suffered. It was my father who lost his farm. It was my mother who couldn't go on to school. It was my mother, who uh, my uncle, who died in Europe fighting for our nation. It's individuals who suffered. It's individuals who should receive that compensation. And so this argument continued in the community. So for the 70s, our community was debating, should we even go for this? And if, in what, if we do, in what form? And how should we ask for the money? And it wasn't until 1978 at the Japanese American Citizens League Convention that they passed their most strongly worded uh, resolution which said we demand an apology and with that apology we want monetary payments and we want those monetary payments in the form of individual and group payments we wanted it all right so they put it together and they said we wanted it all the leadership of the JCL then goes to meet with the four gentlemen that I had talked about earlier, Inoue, Matsunaga, Mineta, and Matsui, and they meet with them in January of 1979. It's the first time these four uh, legislators were in the same room discussing a particular bill together. And the JCL presents their proposal and says, we want you to go fight for this bill. And Senator Matsunaga from Hawaii says, komatta ne, which essentially means big problem, right? <laughs> Because you have to remember, this is the late 70s, and these four Japanese Americans had worked their way to the highest office in, in uh, Washington, D.C., but they had done so not by portraying themselves as Japanese Americans, but they did so by portraying themselves as Americans. And so for them to carry what would be perceived as an ethnic bill or a special interest bill could be political death for them. And in fact, Senator Inoue at one point puts his hand on Bob Matsui's shoulders, and Bob at that time was a freshman representative, and he says, if we carry this bill up next session, this young man won't be sitting here next time. You know? So they realized the political danger that was involved with this particular bill. Senator Inoue also then says, what you need, well, actually, for those of you who know Senator Inoue, he had a very deep voice. So he said, what you need <laughs> is a commission to study the problem, right? And the jaws of the JCL drop because they realize that having a commission study your problem is oftentimes the kiss of death in Washington, D.C. It takes three or four years for them to study the problem. You don't know what they're going to find and what they're going to say. I mean, and what if they found that the camps were justified? That would just shoot the movement right in the foot. 
and then it takes them another year or two to write it up, and then they put it in a book, and then they put it up on the shelf, and nobody ever reads it, right? And worst of all, in the late 70s, it was estimated that with every passing month, 200 elderly Japanese Americans were passing away from age-related illness. So for every month that we waited, justice delayed would be justice permanently denied. These individuals would not get the chance to hear the words, I'm sorry for what you did, for what we did to you. Long story short, again, in the interest of time, the JACL debates this and they decide that they're going to go along with Senator Inouye's recommendation. And the feeling was these four men represented the Japanese American community within the Beltway. If they weren't supportive, if they weren't behind this bill, it wasn't going to go anywhere. Now, as an aside, there was a splinter group that said, well, if they're not courageous enough to carry it, we'll go find somebody. And they did find a freshman representative from the state of Washington named Mike Lowry. Uh, Mike Lowry, who later would go on to be go governor of Washington, when they approached him, he said, I know about this story. My parents used to talk about this as a child at the dinner table. It was wrong, and I would be proud to carry this bill. Problem was, Mike Lowry was a freshman <laughs> representative at the time. He didn't sit on the right subcommittee, and the bill went nowhere, right? But there were other Americans who, even in the late 70s, understood the issue. So we created this commission, and we, the commission was to tour the United States to hear testimony from those who were affected by the camps as well as those who helped to create the camps. They went to 10 different cities, heard testimony from over 750 individuals. But you can imagine, this is the late 70s, and this is a community that one de decade earlier wasn't telling their own children the truth about where they had been born. How do we now expect them to get up before a federal commission and share their story? And in fact, in, in LA, a friend of mine, his name was Ron Wakabayashi, he was uh, the JACL executive director, and what he did is he, he rounded up 15 of the JACL chapter presidents. They all happened to be men at the time. They were all used to doing public speaking. And he says, I'm going to set up a mock commission, a trial run. I want you to practice telling your story. The first guy gets up there, starts telling his story, breaks down crying, can't get through it. Second guy gets up, starts telling his story, breaks down crying, can't get through it. Not one of those 15 chapter presidents who are used to doing public speaking could tell their story. Because for all of them, it was the first time that they were speaking openly about what happened to them and their families. In, in San Jose, I had a friend, Richard Katsuda, who was working with elderly Issei. And he said to them, go to San Francisco. Tell them what happened. And every one of his uh, clients that he was working with said, no, we can't. They were too afraid. Because to them, going and speaking before a federal commission and saying, you did me wrong, was like going before the pearly gates of heaven and saying to God, you gave me a lousy life. You know, it was just... It was just you know, too difficult and beyond what they could imagine doing. And he said to them, if not for yourself, then koromo no tameni, for the sake of your children, for the sake of your grandchildren, go and tell the story. He convinced six of them to go. And he said, on the van ride to San Francisco, you could hear a pin drop, because they were so petrified about what they were about to do. They went to San Francisco, they testified in Japanese and gave the translation to the commission. And on the way back, he said all you could hear was laughing and singing and them slapping each other on the back because they had begun to face their demons. They had begun to tell their story. I was in college at that time, and I attended the Los Angeles hearings. And I can't tell you what it was like. And there are photos of all these hearings where every room is packed. And when I went to the Los Angeles hearing, it was packed, and there were like three overflow rooms where they would pipe the sound into. And we would hear testimony, one person after another, telling their story of what happened during World War II. And mostly, with, I mean, I would say 95% were Japanese Americans and then friends of Japanese Americans, right? And they were all my parents' age, mostly. They were the Nisei. And at the end of the day, there wasn't a dry eye in the audience. 
And for those of you who know Nisei, you know this is a rough and tough and hard to bluff kind of generation. They don't share emotions. And yet, at these hearings, we started to tell our stories. There was a woman from Poston who testified, Eiko Deloitte, and she said that the stress, the diet, and the pain of going to camp hastened my mother's death. She was 52 years old. My regret to this day is that I could not put a fresh flower on her grave. All of our flowers were made of Kleenex. It was this type, thank you, it was this type of testimony that we, we would hear one after another. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Kiyoshi Sonoda. And Kiyoshi Sonoda was a dentist by training. And he testified that because he had some medical training, he was put in charge of the infirmary at his camp. And he described his first patient, a young, dehydrated infant. And Dr. Sonoda said that under normal circumstances, with the proper supplies, he would have been able to treat that infant and make him well. But because he didn't have the proper supplies, all he could do was hold that infant in his hands and feel his last twitch before he died. And as he told this story, Dr. Sonoda had tears streaming down his face. And in the audience, his wife was sitting there and she said, Kiyoshi is crying. Kiyoshi doesn't cry. Kiyoshi didn't even cry at his own father's funeral. But on that day, Dr. Sonoda did cry. And a room full of people, and truly a community full of people, cried with him. As we found the courage, the strength, and the need to tell our story. And as powerful as those testimonies were at the commission hearings, I would say to you that the more powerful testimony actually occurred in people's homes, in their dining rooms, and in their living rooms, as the young Sansei would ask their parents and their grandparents, tell us what happened. Tell us what you went through. And for possibly the first time, they would tell their, their children and their grandchildren what they went through and what it was like for them. And the parents and grandparents would ask their grandchildren, can we really get this apology? Can we really get this redress? And the answer was, we don't know, but we have to try. And so the community that had been fractured by all the discussions that we've been having today, by all the arguments that we were having today, started to coalesce around this idea that justice delayed is justice denied, and we are owed an apology. A year later, the commission comes out with its findings in a document called Personal Justice Denied. And in that uh, findings, it said that the camps were wrong, and that the camps were the result of war hysteria, race prejudice, and a failure of political leadership. War hysteria, race prejudice, and a failure of political leadership. When does that sound like? <laughs> this isn't, okay, this was written in 1983, or uh, 1982, about 1942. Published in 83, I believe, 82, 83. Uh, but, but truly, as I share those words with you today, of wartime hysteria, race prejudice, and a failure of political leadership, to me that sounds like now. You know, that we are at a time where we have war hysteria in terms of we are at war with terrorism. And we need to keep ourselves safe, there's no doubt about it. But we need to be vigilant about our own civil, li civil liberties in doing so. Race prejudice, I don't think I need to belabor that point. Um, and a failure of political leadership. And that is not a cheap shot at President Trump. I'm speaking about our entire federal government. When we can't even pass a budget bill on time, because everything has to be partisan, everything has to be party line, then the best part of our government to compromise and to lead uh, has taken away. So history may not always repeat itself exactly, but it certainly rhymes with, it, with itself. And I'm worried that it's rhyming 
now. The Commission also recommended an apology in monetary redress payments. So we are off to the races. We're ready to roll. And in the interest of time, unless you want to come outside with me for the next five hours, but there are wonderful, wonderful stories about how we, over the next four years, we lobby for this bill in the House and in the Senate. And critical to this lobbying effort were the roles of our veterans during World War II. Because all you had to do was tell the story of the Japanese American soldiers that laid down the, their lives for our nation. And as Senator Inouye would say, you look at the legislators and all you have to do is tell that story and say, where were you? you know, type of thing. And it, very powerful. And yet there was still opposition in the 80s to recognizing what the uh, United States had done, not to Japanese Americans, but to Americans, you know, to, our, to people who should have been protected by birthright. So the bill finally hits the floor on September 17, 1987. We chose that date specifically because it's the anniversary of something. September 17, 1987, two brownie points. What's that the anniversary of? There you go. You, that PhD came in handy. All right, Debbie. <laughs> Congrats. It's the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. We chose that day specifically. We were lucky that it was the 200th anniversary, but September 17th in particular, because we framed this bill not as a let's help the poor Japanese Americans that were in camp bill, but we called it the Civil Liberties Bill. Because this was more than just about Japanese Americans. This was about the Constitution. Yeah. Yes? The question was, did the, Japan, did the U.S. government find any valid reason to incarcerate Japanese Americans during that time? And uh, let me address this very uh, specifically by saying there were no documented cases of any espionage or sabotage on the part of Japanese Americans on the West Coast. Um, there were no uh, charges filed and there were no uh, court proceedings. There was one case in the Midwest somewhere, and, and I'm not an expert on this, where there were two Japanese women from Japan who helped with some German POWs that were being helped there. But that really was a case of them falling in love with these guys and helping them out type of thing. But no, so there were no documented cases, right? But let me address your question in an even larger sense. Even if there had been a documented case, even if they had found the spy, is that an appropriate reason to eliminate the constitutional rights for a whole group of people. No, I, uh, yeah, we're, you and I are speaking rhetorically because I know we're on the same side of the, the, the question. But, you know, so that becomes the question, too, is at one point does the, does the sin of an individual, you know, color the, the, an entire community? And, and today we're facing that as we see individuals doing horrendous things but who do we punish, and how do we prevent that from happening again in the future? Yes? So they, were, they were worried about Japanese Americans going against the interest of the government, but I heard that they didn't lock up the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, which was closest to Japan, and that was the part that got bombed. Let me address that very quickly, because it's an interesting uh, thought. If, you, if this truly were for national security, why did we leave the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, where we had been attacked? You know, they essentially were allowed to continue to live their lives. They were subject to the same curfews that everybody else was and so forth. And then why did we do it on the uh, continental United States? There's one word that I will uh, answer this with. Anybody want to guess? Racism? Well, but then we, if, it was, if it was purely racism, we would have done it to the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, too. Right? We would... The, well... Oh, well, true, okay. Racism was surely a part of it, especially on the West Coast, right? Oh, well, but it was a territory, so it was subject to our laws. Any other one-word answers? I'm only going to take one-word answers. Throw them out. Well, okay, what did you say? 
Fear is, is, a, is a big part of it too, right? But if we were fearful, we should have incarcerated the Japanese Americans in Hawaii too. And the answer here was the economy, or I would say greed, right? In Hawaii, Japanese Americans represented 40% of the labor force. If we had taken the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, and there was talk about doing this, taking them and either sending them to the uh, camps on the mainland or sending them to an outer island, right? the economy of Hawaii would have shut down overnight. They just would not have had enough uh, people to work the plantations and so forth. Conversely, on the West Coast, Japanese Americans had started to work the farmlands and had taken lands that previously had not been very productive, but be through their hard work and ingenuity had made them into very fertile and productive parcels of, of land. And so there were white farmers at that particular time who said, well, if we get rid of them, we can take over their farmland. And you'll hear countless stories of that. You know, so greed worked its magic in a negative way um, for keeping Japanese Americans out of camp in Hawaii and making sure they went to camp in, in uh, the continent, continental United States. Okay, so let's get back to the story because I'm running out of time. But uh, September 17th, it hits the floor of the house. And I'll just tell you one specific story of how Japanese American veterans helped to influence the vote. In 1987, in June, there was a lobbying trip that went to Washington, D.C. of Japanese American activists, most of them just community activists. But there was an uh, uh, elderly gentleman named Rudy Tokiwa. Rudy was 17 years old when he lied about his age and went off to join the 442nd. He was on that lobbying trip. And so he joined uh, two other community activists to go and, er, and lobby a representative from Florida named um, Bennett, Charles Bennett. Rudy dressed up in his army uniform. And the other thing you need to know about Rudy is he walks on crutches, right? But what he doesn't tell people is that he walks on crutches because of a farming accident after the war. But he was a smart cookie. He understood that image is everything, right? He, he was going to wear his army uniform, walk on crutches, and you make your own interpretation. But they go and visit Charles Bennett, who's a moderate Democrat from Florida. And they're supposed to be there at 9 o'clock, no Charles Bennett, 9.10, no Charles Bennett, 9.20, no Charles Bennett. Finally, Charles Bennett walks in about 25 minutes late, and he goes, yeah, what can I do for you? Yeah, not a very warm introduction. The two community activists say to him, well, sir, we're here to talk to you about H.R. 442. That was the title of the bill at the time. And he stops them. He goes, stop. I know all about that damn bill. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not voting for any bill that makes my country apologize to anyone. So you might, Florida. So you might as well leave. I mean, pretty straightforward, right? So the two community activists say, okay, very good. And they get up and they leave. Rudy Tokiwa continues to sit there. And Charles Bennett looks at him and says, didn't you hear what I said? And Rudy looks at him and he says, uh, before I leave, I just wanted to thank you. And Charles Bennett looks at him and says, thank me? I just told you I'm not voting for your bill. And he says, that's not what I'm talking about. I wanted to thank you for your service as a representative, and I wanted to thank you for your service as a veteran, because I know you, every day you think about that damn bullet that's in your back like I think about the damn bullet that's in my back. Rudy had done his homework. He knew that Charles Bennett was a, a wounded veteran from the Vietnam War, right? Charles Bennett looks at him and says, now this is according to Rudy, and Rudy has very crusty language, right? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say it on, I'm being recorded. He's, but Rudy says, yeah, and then he looks at me and he says, you're all right, you son of a bitch. You know, now leave. So, so Rudy leaves. But Rudy calls that office every day and hounds his staff, saying, I want to talk to the representative. Finally, Charles Bennett tells his staff, just tell the guy I'm going to vote for his bill. I don't know if he really meant it, but he said, tell him I'm going to vote for his bill. So that was in about July. The bill hits the floor in September, and Charles Bennett has once again changed his mind. The bill is too expensive for him, and he's committed to voting against the bill. He tells three of his junior representatives from Florida, you vote with me on this bill. So they go down to the House floor. The debate is raging. And Representative Mineta walks over to Charles Bennett and says, hey, you see who's up in the rafters? He looks up there in the handicapped section with his army scarf on, staring at him, is Rudy Tukiwa. I can't tell you what Charles Bennett thought in the moment, 
but I can tell you how Charles Bennett voted, and he voted for the bill. <laughs> so again, a very tangible uh, example, probably embellished a little bit by my good friend Rudy Tokiwa. So the bill passes on September 17, 1987. 243 representatives vote in favor of this unprecedented bill. 180 of them are Democrats. 63 of them are Republicans. Truly a bipartisan effort. Something that probably couldn't happen today in our Congress. But truly, people reached across the aisle and said, we understand what this bill is about. Newt Gingrich voted for this bill. Henry Hyde voted for this bill. Dick Cheney voted for this bill because they understood what was that. Yes? I think all our representatives did not vote for that bill. Was that Colby? Colby? Yeah, Lujan did not vote for the bill. He said he would not vote for that bill until we had apologized for World War II. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and I uh, hold on to that thought. And uh, uh, yes, uh, so th there were representatives, there were senators uh, that we'll talk about in a minute that didn't vote against, that voted against the bill. But some very conservative Republicans voted for this bill. Ex exactly. Hold on to that thought, because I got a, a story that will match that in, in that sense. So we, it passes the House. We now go to the Senate, right? And in the Senate, we knew it was going to pass, because Senator Matsunaga had lobbied all 99 other senators. And he had 71 co-sponsors going into the vote. So we knew it was going to pass the Senate. The only interesting thing to talk about on, in April of 1988, when it was on the Senate floor, is that Jesse Helms, the re, uh, Republican senator from North Carolina, introduced an amendment that said, we will not apologize to Japanese Americans until Japan apologizes to the soldiers that it killed at Pearl Harbor. In 1988, a U.S. senator, much like your representative, could not distinguish between what a warring nation had done to enemy combatants versus what our nation had done to its own citizens. To the credit of the Senate, only two other senators voted in favor of that amendment. Even senators who ultimately voted against the bill for whatever reason said, that's not what this bill is about, and we're not going to support that amendment. But it's a sad commentary that in 1988 there were still folks that felt that way. But it passes the Senate. My gosh, it passes the House, it passes the Senate. It was what we would call the impossible dream because for many of us, myself included, when we first started talking about this in the 70s, it was like there was no way that this was going to happen. But now we needed just one more signature, one more supporter, and that, of course, is the President of the United States. And in 1988, who was the President? Ronald Reagan. And for those of you who remember Ronald Reagan, very conservative president, right, uh, whose own administration had been fighting against this bill in the Congress as well as in the courts. And so many of us, myself included, thought there is no way on God's green earth that Ronald Reagan is going to sign this bill, right. But the true believer said, no, we need to push on. So for those of you who remember Reagan, whether you agreed with his policies or not, most people would agree that Ronald Reagan was a great communicator. He had the ability to tell stories in such a way that it would touch people's hearts and move them in a certain direction. Well, the opposite was true of Ronald Reagan. If you could tell him a story that would touch his heart, you could have a great advocate on your hands. But the question was, what story could we tell Ronald Reagan that would make this personal to him, right? Well, remember earlier I told you about a sergeant named Kazuo Masuda the one who said that he was fighting because it was the only way that he knew that his family could have a chance in America. Two weeks after giving that interview, Sergeant Masuda was killed in battle in Italy, fighting for his nation, the United States of America. After the war, his family was released from their camp, and they moved back to Santa Ana, California, only to be met with hate speech, threats of bodily harm, and racist taunts. The Army realized that this was a PR fiasco, that one of its own fallen heroes, his own family, couldn't move back home. 
So they sent out a contingent of army officers to have a medal ceremony for the Masuda family. They presented the Masuda family with the Distinguished Service Cross. And that night at a convention dinner, one of the officers spoke. He was a young white American captain by the name of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan addressed the audience by saying, the blood that is soaked into the sands is all of one color. America stands unique in the world, the only country not founded on race, but on an ideal. Mr. and Mrs. Masuda, as one member of the American family to another, for what your son Kazuo did, thanks. That story was relayed back to President Reagan in the 80s, and his response was, I remember that family, and I remember what those soldiers did for America. It made it personal for him. I don't think it was the only reason, but on August 10, 1988, President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, granting an apology and $20,000 individual payments to every individual affected by Executive Order 9066 and creating a $50 million trust fund. Now again, I don't think that story was the only reason. It put him in the proper mindset. I think the fact that it was his last year in office was truly uh, a blessing for the movement because he wouldn't then be accountable in the same way that if it was his first term in office and he was thinking about re-election. Uh, Japanese Americans and Asian Americans were becoming a real political force in California and he knew that George Bush would need to carry California to become president. So there were political, there were uh, timing, and there were personal reasons why he went forward and he signed that bill. To date, over 82,000 individuals have received the apology and have received the monetary redress payments. But lest any of us think that it's a wonderful story and it's now permanently, uh, justice is permanently secured, I'd like to end by sharing with you the words of the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Antonin Scalia, when looking back on this issue, said, the Korematsu decision was wrong but you are kidding yourself if you think it will never happen again. In times of war, the laws fall silent. In times of war, the laws fall silent. Very chilling words for all of us as non-aliens who love our Constitution and love the laws that this land was built on. So as you join me here today, thank you for spending the afternoon with me and let us commit ourselves to, in this nation, never again will we let our laws fall silent. Thank you all. Let's thank uh, Dr. Mitch Baki again for making a second trip out here. His first speech on June 1st was very spellbinding. And today's one was even more. Now, do we hear a third visit? Sure. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us. Do we have time for questions? Okay, we do. So I, I'd be happy to try to answer whatever questions or make up answers, whatever I would have to do. But let me say, I really enjoy coming out to Albuquerque, and last night I went out to Gallup and visit, visited with Hershey Miyamura, and we had a wonderful time. I would love to come back, and I always love coming back to the Albuquerque Museum, but more important, if any of you have connections with the schools, I would love to go and speak in the schools, Whatever, however you can use me and abuse me. As, as you can tell, I love telling this story. And truly, if I had had three hours, I, I have many more stories that I didn't share with you here today. But however you think you can use me to tell this American story, as I tell people, I don't think this is a great Japanese-American story. I think this is a great American story. It's a story of how our nation was able to have the courage and the strength to look at a time in our nation's history when we did abandon our principles and then, in a measured way, atone for it. So it talks about the strength of our nation, and, and I would welcome the opportunity to come back and speak anywhere. Yes? You can mention this uh, thing being passed around in Kano. I will. Because I brought it from the Mennonite pilgrimage, and um, it's too... Oh. <laughs>
Um, I picked up this petition at the Minidoka pilgrimage. Minidoka was one of the camps that was in southern Idaho where my father was. And um, this one is to, one of, part of it is not valid, but the Fort Sill, because they say they're not going to do it, but they want to close the camps, um, children's camp, all the children, dis detention camps, and that's what this petition is. And um, it's being um, started by a Japanese American community in San Jose, California. And along with that, I also have a sign-in sheet for Go For Broke National Education Center. If you'd like to be on our email list where we send you our newsletter and other information, please fill that out. And I have information on that table about Go For Broke National Education Center. Please feel free to take it. Uh, I saw a hand here, here, and then I'll get to you in the back. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you, Andy. So we'll go here, and then we'll go in the back. How, how far did we intern people? I mean, were New Mexicans interned? Were... No. Uh, so the, what happened was there was what was called the exclusion line that started up in Washington State and extended down through Arizona. And essentially, it, it came down in how they actually drew it. I'm not, uh, there are probably a lot of uh, politics around how they drew it. But it essentially cut Washington, Oregon, California, and Arizona in half. And so if you lived east of, um, west of that exclusion line, you would have to, to move. If you lived on the uh, east side of it, you would not have to move to camp. And in Arizona, it, it, one city, Glendale, was literally cut in half. The, the exclusion line went down Main Street. And so if you lived west of Main Street, you, you're off to camp. If you lived on the east side, you were able to stay. That's how crazy it was in, in that sense. Here in New Mexico, you're definitely uh, um, east of the line. But there were still individuals who were picked up and, uh, you know, there's a great story of uh, Gallup, uh, New Mexico, where the mayor said, we're not going to turn over our Japanese-American families. So there were moments of great courage and compassion at that time uh, by Americans who were uh, stood up for Japanese-Americans. In, yeah, it's, it, can, we hand the, can we hand the mic back? Uh, and then go ahead. Oh, you have another one. Okay. Uh, talking about strange lines, my aunt's family was west of in Oregon, and they weren't sent to camp. They were sent to the east part of Oregon because they were farmers to help the farmers on the east side of Oregon. Go ahead. I was just, is this talking? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. I was curious about the, what's happened with the camps. Are they, are any, you mentioned a camp, but I'm not sure if they're still in existence. It seems like it should be like a, a national park or something. It, and the question is, uh, the question was what happened to these camps? Now, when I'm, the camps that I'm referring to are what were known as the WRA camps, the War Relocation Authority. And the, there, there were 10 of those. And the, there's, those are the big ones. Those are the ones that we all hear about, Manzanar, Heart Mountain, Minidoka, Roar, Jerome, and so forth. So let me address that first. Of the 10 camps, I would say about five or six of them have become National Park Service uh, uh, historic uh, sites where they have even um, educational facilities on them. I know that's specifically true of Manzanar, which I visited, and Heart Mountain, and some of the other camps, Minidoka, uh, where uh, there is oversight. But then in other camps, uh, there may just be a marker and an indication of what happened there during World War II. For example, at Jerome or Roar, those are both in Arkansas. There are markers there. At, I believe it's Roar. There's still a graveyard where some of the people were buried and, and so forth. But the buildings are gone and so forth. But like, say, at Manzanar, they've recreated the guard tower. They've recreated some barracks. So it, it varies, right? There were also other types of camps. There were Department of Justice camps. Uh, there were what were called assembly centers. And let me first speak to the assembly centers. Assembly centers were where Japanese Americans were first sent before they were sent to the permanent WRA camps. And in many cases, these were horse uh, racetracks. 
in Los Angeles, they were sent to Santa Anita racetrack. In San Francisco, they were sent to Tanfran racetracks. In uh, Seattle, they were sent to Puyallup fairgrounds. And they were housed in horse stables, literal horse stables that were just quickly washed down a week or two before. And so for those of you who've lived on a farm, you know you don't get rid of the stench of urine and feces just by washing it down. But for several months, while the permanent camps were being built, uh, you know, Japanese American families were housed in these facilities. Because many of these racetracks still exist, there may be a marker there or an indicator that uh, the camps were there. But uh, to my knowledge, none of the assembly camps have truly been preserved in, in their original form. You've heard mention Fort Sill, and Fort Sill was a Department of Justice camp that housed particular Japanese Americans, mostly adult males, and so forth. So some of those still exist, and in the case of Fort Sill, are still being used for various purposes. So the answer to your question is, it's all across the map. You know, but but uh, from nothing, essentially, to having full-on educational centers at these facilities. Yes? Um, I don't know if you know this woman. Oh, can you take the mic? I don't know if you know this woman. I met her when she lived next door to my son and daughter-in-law in Sacramento, and she wrote this book, Dandelion Through the Crack. She, her family were interned and then later told they were being sent to a, I mean, they were in a relocation center. Um, but she speaks, and I think she has since died, I'm not sure, but she speaks in the public schools in Sacramento because she said the only way something like this will never happen again is to tell the story over and over and over again. Right. Yes, and, and there are literally hundreds, if, if not more, Japanese Americans and people of that generation who continue to tell the story. You know, the challenge is when I take students through exhibits or uh, talk, give these talks and so forth, many of them say, oh, I want to meet somebody who was in camp. You know, and I always have to warn them, if you meet somebody today who was in camp, that means they were, they're like 80 years old. You know, and that means that they were about four or five when they were in camp. And for the kids that were in camp that were four or five, some of them have very pleasant memories, you know, because they're children and they're with their families and they're with other kids and you don't know any better when you're four or five, right? And unfortunately, the ones who you really should be talking to are those that were in their 20s and had to go off to war, or even more so those that are in their 40s and 50s who lost everything midlife, you know. But people like the woman that you're referring to whether it's through her book, whether it's through her public speaking at that time, continue to do a service for all Americans as we tell our story so that we don't ever go back to that time. It's not really a question. Adrian and I um, found a population in Clovis, New Mexico. There were 17 children and on the night that they were taken, the 17th was born APOW. Um, but uh, as Mitch was referring, um, you can go to Fort Stanton. They were held there before they were, the families were taken to different camps and the families that had known each other were split apart to different camps. But what he just said about speaking to schools, speaking to your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews. Um, Adrian and I had a wonderful chance to speak at the Manal School and if you can reach a child that is 11 or 12 years old, we can skip all these adults that are arguing right now, ignore them, and go back and tell these children that they're your future. They're the ones that are going to stop this, tell them they're important, that they're loved, and it doesn't have anything to do with their skin, what an adult tells them that they are. It's about what was given a long time ago, paid for by blood. And if you let them see these medals, hold food stamps, they pass them around, they want to hear more, and they cannot believe this happened. So it's word of mouth. It's not just Mitch's job. It's not my job. It's an American job to get this story brought back. <laughs>